how do we gain that, that trust? I know that there were programs in Ontario, in Toronto, for example, where Toronto police officers were going from community to community, um, those, uh, as we would quote, high risk or labeled communities, to develop trust within the community, engage in the community and, and whatnot, and quote, protect against gang activity. We were having a, a period of time where there was a, a great deal of gang activity. That fell to the wayside, and there was a small degree of trust that was developed. But I think the community was still very much labeled. So Donovan, how do we gain, how do we build that trust? Because that's one thing that we sort of, I find that in my conversation, we keep coming back to. Do you trust the police officer that's driving down your street? Trust that that, in, that the officer is driving there to ensure that your neighborhood is protected versus driving down that street because maybe he or she has an eye on you because they might suspect something. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I'm gonna go back to a point that uh, Dr. Oriola made and uh, attach that to, to the perspective of immigrant communities. So, uh, I, you know, I'm from the Caribbean and I, and I come here and my thought would be that the police here are different. So mm -hmm. I have a perspective of the criminal justice system, you know, at the different levels based on my experience in my home country. And I migrate to Canada and my thought is, you know, it's 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 a, it's a more advanced community, a society. It has resources. They should be better. Mm. And then I go through the lived experience of what I see, uh, you know, in the interactions with the community, and from simple things like a traffic stop all the way through to to what happens in the courts. And therefore, that is what guides. My, my trust met meter, not mm -hmm. the policies and the, the, the proclamations that are made uh, by, by you know, the, the, the communications representatives. I'm going to speak to what I experienced as a teenage black boy driving my, my car down the street and how I am related to. And I'm going to say, here is what my experience is. Mm -hmm. And trust therefore is, is not just a desired outcome that somebody states, it's the product of these interactions, right? And mm. not necessarily first-hand interaction either. Mm. And to, to, to get to that point, there is a ton of work, and you know, I keep using this unlearning uh, concept, a ton of work that needs to be done on both sides to get us to understand that, hey, there is a commitment to being different, not just in word, but in action. And this is seen uh, in, in a number of different ways through the interactions, through the conversations that are occurring consistently, not just when another crime occurs. Because mm -hmm. that's often when you see and hear the responses and the view is, trust us, we're being better. And the community is looking on and saying, why would I? That's the dilemma that I think we have because I think that the equation of trust isn't properly defined and it is also being driven by an expectation that what is said is going to be reflected collectively in the actions of those who are a part of the process. Hmm. I don't know, Shepard, what are your thoughts here? Um, in terms of your experience, in terms of what you hear from your constituents as well when it comes to that trust, building that trust, maybe even willing to accept that there can, there can be trust. So I think the biggest challenge when it comes to trust, and particularly when we were talking about policing in the criminal justice system, is the power relationship and the um, existing, uh, because there is a power imbalance, of course, between what, what we empower police to do and for good reason, and what the average citizen feels that they have in that relationship. So when communities feel that they are disempowered and that they are being disproportionately impacted as a result of that by a position of power, then there is no trust. So one of the toughest things to do is to figure out how you set that aside in building a relationship of trust. And that's something I had to learn somewhat as a politician. Uh, I didn't grow up in the black community. I didn't spend much of my life, frankly, around a lot of other black people. So for myself, after being elected and beginning to work with it and reach out to the black community, I 
tried to be very careful about coming in at first to listen and not coming in with an agenda, not coming in with an expectation and working to empower the communities and the folks that I was working with to find ways that I could support the things that they wanted to accomplish and they wanted to do and build that relationship first before I started looking at other things that we could do together. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have, I think, in addressing racism in general is that if we are really going to tackle these deep systemic things, these this breaking of trust that has taken generations to put in place. We have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to give up power. And the very nature of the relationship in policing and in the criminal justice system is very antithetical to that. And the feeling of folks in the public is that this is a system that exists to make them feel safe. And mm -hmm. to give up some of that feels unsafe. So it's when, when Donovan talks about unlearning, those are some of the very deep and profound things that we're needing to tackle. So I, I appreciate what the, what the doctor was sharing about uh, finding ways to get around that by sending police out with community organizations, giving them the experience of being out there on the ground, getting that sense of what it means for these individuals, recognizing that the individuals they are serving uh, have a very different experience of the world and a very different experience of them in uniform than what they might themselves perceive. Dr. Aurelia, um, your thoughts on, and, and I know you touched on this earlier as well, um, and I guess it's sort of part and parcel of my question on trust, and, and we can elaborate further on this, is the representation within the criminal justice system at levels where perhaps decisions are being made um, you know, whether it's at a position where uh, Honorable Shepherd is in or we're looking at somebody within the criminal justice system that might be a judge or might be someone at that level of policy change mm -hmm. that they're seeing what needs to be, what needs to happen. How important is that? Is that a, an important first step, for example? Or are there so many elements that we need to be looking at here that it's not just, you know, to start on one factor, but perhaps we need to be starting on, on several? Right, right. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's uh, it's an important question. Um, I came across um, a, a, a data from um, Statistics Canada uh, in which they indicated that up to 90%, a solid 90% of Canadians said that they had either a great deal of confidence or some confidence in the police. So the police as a broad category, 90%. In the same survey, only 42% of Canadians said that they believed the police were fair. <laughs> that, that's very revealing. Keep in mind the proportion of uh, visible minorities in Canada is roughly 22% or thereabout. So it wasn't just visible minorities who were saying that. Uh, in other words, um, non-visible minority Canadians who probably had not had any first-hand uh, brutal experience with the police where she had the, the sentiments around fairness and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not to vilify the police. That's just to give an accurate picture of what's going on. On one hand, there is a degree of trust and confidence that's in place at a generic, broad, amorphous level. Um, again, uh, uh, Mr. Simon talked about uh, coming from the Caribbean and all of that. The, the reality is that immigrant Canadians have a great deal more confidence and trust in the criminal justice system than Canadian born visible minorities. It, it, that is interesting because, but it, over time, that then decreases as they begin to have certain encounters or experiences, or in many cases, as they begin to raise children particularly black and brown boys, who then begin to have certain experiences on the streets. So through that vicarious victimization, they begin to change their minds and perspectives about the police and policing. The good thing is that that doesn't have to be the case. It is not inevitable that we would have mistrust between the police and the communities they serve. That relationship can be improved. How can we do this? In the uh, public consultations that I was privileged to be a part of, uh, done by the uh, um, Office of the uh, Solicitor General, Ministry of the Solicitor General and Minister of Justice just this year, 
participants spoke about often being treated like criminals. Just a, a flat out assumption, a priori, that they must be criminal or up to no good for no just reason. <laughs> um, that's number even on cases involving things like just parking, you know. Um, <laughs> I spoke with um, a, a, a Alberta's uh, first disability advocate uh, who shared a, an anecdote and experience with me where he came to the conclusion that the officer seemed angry, that he just seemed to have anger issues and seemed somewhat traumatized. Now, why is that important? Well, the mental health of the officers also need to be part of the conversation. Now, we know from available evidence that police officers are less likely than civilians to acknowledge that they have mental health issues and to seek help for those mental health issues. So, A, we should be making mental health support available to our police officers, and B, we should ensure that periodically they, and, and in, in an ongoing, consistent basis, that they make use of those services. We rarely put that as part of the conversation but it is absolutely fundamental because sometimes the problem is not just the officer. The problem is the human being behind the officer. If, you, if we hire incredibly traumatized people with uh, uh, anger issues, mental health issues, well, the results would show. Now, the other thing just pertains to basic dignity and respect for members of the public. Are we extending that to the average Joe or Jane on the street. That's the key thing. Um, the people need to be treated with dignity and respect. People would in fact not recall, and, and we saw this in uh, the public engagements that we did, the ticket that they got would not even be any uh, uh, real focus. But the way the officer talked to them would always you know, be at the top of the agenda how he, the, the officer spoke to them, whether the officer was respectful or not. Those are the key variables. And yes, representation in police services matters. It is everything. The police services, police organizations should reflect the communities they serve. So you, we can look at the numbers in our, in our province, the numbers nationally, we should at the minimum mirror those demographics, mirror those numbers, so that if we have an RCMP with only 1.5% black police officers, uh, that is uh, absolutely embarrassing, uh, despite years, if not decades, of fine grain diversity and inclusion policy. Uh, <laughs> It is embarrassing that that is the, the, the current state of affairs. So, and it's not just the average police officer on the street uh, that needs to reflect the communities they serve. It's also the senior leadership. I find in my own experience that uh, where you have organizations uh, that are not very diverse at the level of decision-making, they make rudimentary blunders. It, it is calamitous. Part of it is that each individual embodies uh, an ideation or universe, uh, a set and constellation of experiences, a lived reality. We need those at the table where key and critical decisions are being made. Now, where that doesn't happen, where you have a monolithic, non-diverse, almost 100% male environment, they make blunders, they make errors because certain experiences are not there. And even when they are doing their best, even with the best of intentions, they make errors uh, that would then seem to be to the average member of the public as rather obvious. Didn't you know that this shouldn't have been done? Because the errors are so ridiculous. Now, right. that's what you get when you are not diverse. That's what you get when you don't seek to bring in different individuals uh, from different walks of life to the table.